Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I am delighted to talk to Yusuf Oxton. You're most welcome, sir. Asalaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam. It's uh, an honor to be here, Paul. So thank you for having me. Thank you. It's great to see you, Yusuf. Um, Yusuf Oxton, also known as Russell Oxton, was an ordained Anglican priest, that's in the Church of England, for 12 years. After five years in parish ministry, he spent seven years of ministry in healthcare, working as a hospital chaplain in East London and as a hospice chaplain in Kent. In 2010, he made the life-changing decision to embrace Islam and become a Muslim. Since then, he worked for a charity, a Quaker charity in London, before retraining as an English language teacher. He married his Nubian Egyptian Yemeni wife and moved to Cairo. After a year in Egypt, he moved to the Sultanate of Oman, where he has lived and worked for 10 years with his wife and two children. About his conversion to Islam, he wrote, and I quote, Never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined becoming a Muslim and moving to Arabia, but ultimately, when Allah calls you from the deepest part of your heart, you have a choice to make. Deny your authentic self or embrace the change. Dive into the unknown and embark upon the journey. It has not been without its trials, but becoming a Muslim was the best decision of my life. Alhamdulillah. End quote. Marvelous uh, words there. And just a couple of words from the Quran. The Quran says, you will find that the nearest in affection towards the believers are those who say, we are Christians because there are priests and monks among them. And because these people are not given to arrogance. That's Quran 582. And in another place we read, it is Allah who guides whoever he wills, and he knows best who are fit to be guided. Quran 2856. So, Yusuf, um, could you share something of your spiritual journey as a priest uh, and how you came to be interested in Islam? Sure. Thank you, Paul. Um, Bismillah. I think what I, what I want to do is I just want to start by sharing with you you mentioned i'm here in oman and subhanallah i was actually here as a child i lived in oman for two years in the mid 70s my father my late father was working here and uh never never in my wildest dreams did i think i would actually be here now mm -hmm. living and working with my family having my children here um and returning back to oman so Subhanallah, I do feel like my life has gone full circle. Absolutely. Uh, returning to this wonderful land. Um, but yes, I think um, my earliest memory of Islam was actually here in Oman. I was about five years old. And we used to have an Omani, a traditional Omani Jabali man, somebody from the mountains. And he would... Um, basically be some kind of protection or babysitter for us um, during those times of some trouble in Oman in the mm. mid to late 70s. And I have a very vivid memory of this man with his kanja knife and his very long hair um, going into prayer, praying the salah, and going into sujood, prostrating himself in front of the door where we were. And that's one of my earliest memories as a child. So I mm. think it's very fascinating that mm. that has remained with me through my journey. Uh, and, and now, 40 okay. years later, mm. um, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm here, back here as a Muslim. Amazing. So that's just a, a memory. Um, my own journey, I think, was quite a gradual journey. I would say, um, consciously, it took about two two to three years before I finally made the decision to embrace Islam and declare the Shahada. Um, as you mentioned, I was ordained in 98 as a deacon, 99 as a priest. Um, after, after five years of parish ministry, I'd always 
been attracted to healthcare chaplaincy during mm. my training. So I was lucky enough to be uh, appointed uh, chaplain, just having a problem there, uh, at uh, a very busy, a very busy East London hospital um, where there was a very high Muslim population, incredibly diverse, multicultural area of London. And I spent five incredibly intense mm. years working there as a chaplain in this cauldron, if you like, of, uh, of a lot of issues, a lot of challenges, both social um, and in, in terms of diversity, really. Mm. Um, and I met a really, it was the first time in my life that I was living alongside Muslims. Many of my shopkeepers were, were Muslim. Mm. Many of the staff, many of the patients, the visitors were Muslim. My office was right next door to the multi-faith prayer room. Oh. So on a daily basis, I right. would see Muslims very quietly come mm. to pray, uh, very quietly, uh, in a very dignified manner. Uh, I found I found the, the salah, a very dignified, simple mm. act of worship. And without any, any inkling that this was going to impact me at all, mm -hmm. um, I was impressed, I was impressed by so many Muslims that I, ha I met over that five-year period. Mm, mm. Um, so that really was my first daily um, exposure to Islam through the mm. people I met. Mm. Um, no, no real uh, theological discovery or, or reading was going on at that point. Um, it was just that, that daily exposure to, to so many Muslims. Um, mm, mm. And uh, I think um, what I would say that during my training, I was lucky enough to be chosen to travel to India on a student exchange. So a training priest from India came to Birmingham and I was chosen to travel to South India yeah. to study for about four months in a seminary. And it was a, an amazing occasion. And I remember a very well-esteemed, highly respected priest, um, Reverend Canon Andrew Wingate. I'm not sure if um, he is still alive, a, a wonderful man. And he had spent many years in India exploring interfaith dialogue. And he took me on a visit to a village in a very rural part of India. And he took me to the local mosque and we sat down and we watched the Muslims of the village come together and to pray. Mm. And again, that had uh, quite an impact for me to watch these villagers uh, come together and to pray the Asa prayer together. And <clears throat> Andrew and I simply watched. And again, I absorbed that experience and it was placed somewhere in my heart. Right. Uh, at a later date so mm. it was these moments I think that had an impact but bizarrely and ironically it's when I left London um, and I moved to East Kent mm -hmm. which at the time had a tiny tiny Muslim population mm. um, it was here working in the hospice mm. which was a wonderful experience for me I felt uh, incredibly affirmed and loved by the staff and by the patients. It was a very intimate, quite intense experience working in a, a small hospice. On day three, I decided to take out my clerical collar um, as I felt it was no longer really appropriate in such a, a small, intimate place where everybody knew me as Russell, the chaplain. Right. Uh, the, collar, the collar just... I, I began to see it may be a hindrance rather than mm. a help. Um, so I was known as Russell, the chaplain, and I spent an amazing year there. And it was at this point, I began to start reading um, about Islam. Oh. Um, I started reading um, the Quran. Um, when I left London, the palliative care team of whom I was an integral part, gave me some money as a gift and i bought a english translation of the quran gosh 
and I took that with me to East Kent. Mm. And it was during that year that I read the Quran. I began with Surah Maryam. Hmm. And I began to expose myself to Islamic books and reading. So I just say, sorry, just to say, to interrupt, yeah. Surah yes. Miriam, of course, if those of you don't know, is the chapter of the Quran named after Mary, who was yes. the mother of Jesus. So yes. it's highly significant uh, that you as a, a Christian chaplain should read uh, a, a chapter named after, as I say, the Mary, the mother of Jesus. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, mm. and I have to tell you, Paul, it was very revelatory for me. Mm. to be to be uh you know reading these words um about uh, uh mary and of course jesus isa um mm. and it was a, a revelation and so on my days off and and i'm sure you'll smile about this paul on my days off i would travel to london and i would go and i hope they're still open i would go to al taqwa books um mm. on, on baker street um, I yeah, they're, they're still open i was there several days ago still, still quite Mm. A, a great a great bookshop and mm. also um having known east london i would travel to zamzam books oh, yeah, on yeah. Green street um, Huge. In, uh, in east mm. london yeah. an excellent bookshop uh, there was a very there was a young man who worked there who was such a great guide for me who would recommend books for me to read mm. and, and so there i was traveling incognito um, <laughs> to to london and mm. i began to slowly build up uh, an Islamic library uh, back home Interesting. Uh, and so I began to feel that my heart my heart was beginning to shift mm. and I really do feel primarily it's been a journey of the heart mm. Um, mm. Allah guides whom he wills as you mentioned and there was definitely a beginning of a shift and what was an interest was becoming a very intense dialogue with Islam and mm. I began to see that this was taking me deeper into a, an inner conflict with my with myself right. um, and and you know again Allah works uh, in mysterious ways I returned to East London I was appointed a chaplain at another very large East London hospital with again a, a very very large muslim population so mm. i found myself back in that very diverse vibrant east london um and it was here really that the momentum began to really uh take hold and i knew that i was on a journey that could be very very significant and <laughs> that's when i began to reach out Right. So at that point, what, did you even think about the end uh, of your journey being conversion to Islam? Or was it just a, uh, an uh, a increasingly intensive spiritual ex um, exploration? Or, or, uh, what, did you have a clear end goal at that point? No, I, I think what I knew was happening was there was a, something very profound was happening spiritually mm. for me. Mm. Um, and I was beginning to ask questions. But at that point, I, I had not really envisioned that end point, if you like, of becoming a Muslim. Um, but I did begin to reach out to uh, a small number of people. And I would like to mention a dear, a dear brother who sadly suddenly passed away about five or six years ago. And he was Idris Tawfiq. Oh, yes. Now, Idris Tawfiq was a, a former Roman Catholic priest from mm. England. Mm. He left the priesthood and became a teacher for a short time and then himself converted to Islam and I discovered him on the internet. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I remember sitting in my office at the hospital, sending him an email, feeling I was taking a little bit of a risk, um, sending this to him. And I sent it and many days went by and then suddenly I got the most beautiful long pastoral response from wow. Idris Tawfiq. And it was very caring, very wise, mm -hmm. and it helped me a great deal. And can you believe it, Paul? Three years later, subhanAllah, I, this is a crazy story. I was with my wife in Cairo. We were walking into a shopping mall in central Cairo, 
and out walks Idris Taufik. Wow. Um, he had moved to Egypt. Mm. And by chance, by Allah, we walked into him and I said, hmm. I'm Russell. Uh, hmm. You may not remember me. You sent me the most beautiful response to my email. And here I am. I'm now a Muslim. Three years later, I'm living in Cairo. And we had the most wonderful conversation on the streets of Cairo uh, three years later. So I'm, I'm he, he would have remembered you, of course. I'm sure yes. he would have remembered you. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was forever grateful for him. Um, and, and then um, you and I met through London Central Mosque. We did. And we did. I used to go to, I think it was called a Saturday circle i think or, or oh, you know, the, 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 the circle at regent's park yes. mosque it still meets there every saturday at 3 p.m mm -hmm. and i i go um uh, every now and then occasionally talk there as well yeah the islamic so it, it was actually founded by uh cat stevens uh use of islam back in 1977 and you know it's been going every saturday since without fail since 1977 mashallah, <laughs> and, mashallah. and you you've taken you've taken the words from me paul Alhamdulillah. Oh, I'm I'm your so <laughs> amazing because Mm. Uh, one of those Saturdays, by chance, mm. um, it had not been announced. I was uh, in in the in the auditorium, and suddenly there was a lot of noise, um, a lot of discussion. Somebody had entered the room, oh, and in cool. walks Yusuf Islam. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I met I met Yusuf Islam um, at the end of one of the talks. Complete surprise. There was a, a huge crowd around him, and I waited yeah. very patiently uh, for him, and he had noticed me. And so, again, I approached him, and again, um, he was a man of great humility. Yes, I found him, yes. I found him to be a very humble man, mashallah. And he, he also yeah. gave me some advice, because at that time, Paul, I felt there were one or two um, Muslims who were putting great pressure on me to convert in that moment. And right. I, did not, I did not feel ready. No, and, no. And Yusuf, Yusuf Islam, gave me great advice, you know, ultimately this is between you and Allah. Take your time, listen to the whisperings of your heart, follow your heart, and you will know when you're ready. And it just stead it steadied me at that point. Good advice, good advice. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, mm. Because I think what I can't underestimate, um, Paul, is when I took my ordination vows in 1999, I took them extremely serious. Mm -hmm. um, I anticipated a lifelong service to the church as a priest. Um, being a priest was everything to me. Mm -hmm. um, I became a, a practicing Christian when I was a, in my late teens, and I became very active within the Anglican Church. And uh, it just became. To, just to clarify, sorry to interrupt. Yes. The Anglican Church, yes. for those who don't know, is uh, also known as the Church of England. Yes. It's the yes. official established church of Britain. In other words, it's, you know, the, the head of state, the King Charles III, he's the head of the church. And, uh, you know, the bishops sit in the House of Lords and, you know, it's the official church of Britain or United Kingdom. Um, so it's not some kind of sect or something. It's, it's the, the church. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you were obviously a priest in, in that church um, for, for some years. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, just very, very, yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Very mainstream, you know, institutional yeah. church. I was in the heart of it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I think, um, yeah, so, so for me, um, being a priest was incredibly important. And I want to say, you know, here we are, Paul, um, it's Holy Week for, for Christian uh, brothers and sisters across the world. Um, and I met some incredibly holy men and women within the church who I continue to deeply respect. Some of them have remained friends. And so I'm very mindful today as we journey through Ramadan Mm. that there are many Christians around the world who are now journeying through Lent. So, so my priesthood meant everything to me. And so when I did begin to contemplate um, converting to Islam, I would say there was a six month period where I felt that I was on the verge of a complete breakdown. I, I, was, I was living this public life as, as the priest um, I was performing the priestly duties and pastoral duties of a chaplain. Mm. Um, I was talking and being alongside many Muslims on a daily basis. Um, and, and then I would go home and I would continue my reading. 
Um, in the hospital, there was a very small prayer room at the top of one of the buildings, very high with amazing scenes of East London. And I would walk into the prayer room and quietly read from the Quran in English wow. whilst I was still a priest. Wow. And so I recognized that something very profound was happening and I was beginning to feel like I was living a double life. Mm. And it was an extremely challenging and difficult time for me. I, I, did, I did seek out a therapist who yeah. also uh, was able to help me um, process and disentangle these emotions and thoughts that I was feeling so that I could begin to see a way forward because it was emotionally, mentally, and spiritually um, a moment of crisis uh, mm -hmm. for me. Of course, extraordinary story. So what, what happened What happened then from this extraordinary crunch time? Uh, I can't imagine yes. what you've gone through. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, again, often it's people and places that have a profound effect on you. And late one night, I was the on-call chaplain in the hospital. And for some reason, the Muslim chaplain was unavailable. So the senior, the senior ward sister of A&E, accident and emergency, called me and said there was a, a young Muslim woman. Um, her young child had been rushed into A&E um, who was critically ill um, due to a, an unforeseen accident. Could you come and offer pastoral support? Mm. So I went quite late in the night um, into the hospital. Um, the ward sister directed me to the waiting room, which was right next door to the resuscitation room. And I met this young woman with extraordinary noor on her face, incredible light on her face. And she was there in a moment of profound crisis for her. And yet she was still able to smile with gratitude uh, at my presence. And we began to exchange conversation as we waited. And she asked me if she could have a prayer mat, a sajada. Mm. So I then rushed up to the, the prayer room, rushed back down and I handed her the sajada and she was deeply grateful. And then completely naturally, completely spontaneously, she moved the furniture aside she took the coffee table aside. She laid out the prayer mat and she prayed. And I stood in the corner silently as she prayed. It was an incredibly moving moment. She was a young, young Algerian woman. Uh, and she prayed and she was most, most grateful. And then we waited for her husband to arrive. He was working, I think he had two or three jobs in order to keep uh, his family. And so he arrived about an hour later. Mm. And again, he had great poise and he was able to share with me his belief as a Muslim at this critical moment for them and their family, what, what believing in Islam means, what believing in Allah means. And he talked about surrender. Mm. He talked about tawakul trust in Allah. And so we sat and we waited and then eventually the uh, medical team said they had stabilized their child. And so I guided them, um, I walked them into the resuscitation room where they could see their child. And the mother had the most incredible face of love um, that a mother can have for her child. And they stabilized uh, their child and it felt right after about two or three hours, it was the right time for me to leave. And as I left, she handed me back the sajada. And I said, uh, no, I said, I would like you to have this sajada. And inshallah, may this sajada be used by yourself and in years to come by your child. Oh. Um, and, and uh, eventually, I think that night, they were transferred to a, a more specialist hospital. I think it was the Royal London or Great Ormond Street. I phoned up some days later, but of course, because of the code of confidentiality, all I knew was that the child had been stabilized and was out of mm. danger. Mm. But you know, Paul, 
I often think about that family, where they are now, how is their child, and really the gift that they gave me, really, the gift of their presence at that critical moment. And she and her husband left a, a really lasting impression at that moment. And again, it just gave me that extra sense of courage and of momentum that I was on a, I was on a journey and there was no going back mm -hmm. <laughs> from this, that I was getting ever, ever closer to Islam. So what was it? Was it the, the, the sense of the profound, the, the sense of surrender, of the, the kind of deep spiritual aspect to Islam, um, trust in God, uh, the integrity, the, uh, the great, uh, you know, the inner, almost the innocence of it, um, yes. devoid yes. of, uh, you know, elaborate ritual and panache. Yes. You know, this was yes. a very pure human act before the Quran. It was these kinds of... Uh, <clears throat> difficult to put into words, but somehow this touched you clearly at a deep level, spiritually, in a way that hadn't <clears throat> touched you before. Uh, and um, yes. I, I think you, you've put it very beautifully, Paul, because I think what I what I discovered was, was this sense of dignity and simplicity and surrender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a, dear, a dear colleague and friend of mine here in Oman, um, a recent convert to Islam, she talked about Islam softening the heart. Oh. Um, and and the clearing the, the the cleaning or the clearing away of the rust mm. from our heart and mm. and there is not to idealize it at all but there is a there is a purity and a, and a sweetness to to Islam that I discovered um, through through the worship through meeting so many Muslims and mm. and you're right Paul that I can be anywhere in the world I can walk into a mosque. I, I can walk into a, a Muslim home and I know that the prayer is going to be the same. Mm. And I think there's great, great unity and a sense of community in that. Um, now, if I'm a Christian and I'm somewhere in the world, before I go to church, I have to ask myself some really interesting questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Do, I, do I want to go to the Catholic Church, the Anglo-Catholic Church? Uh, the liberal catholic church the pentecostal church the methodist the baptist the evangelical the charismatic now some people would say that's huge diverse diversity and it's great but for me for me at the time the evangelical wing of the church was in the ascendancy mm. and i was beginning to feel increasingly marginalized um, by these voices who actually felt very far away from where i was philologically um, and I, I found in Islam this, this great uh, unif uniformity and simplicity in mm -hmm. the worship and this direct, direct relationship with Allah. And I think that brings me on to my, my first Arabic word. That oh, I yes, yes. We're gonna, we're now going to move on, hopefully, to some uh, theological <laughs> So to speak, uh, in terms of because obviously uh, you, the extraordinary journey of the heart, uh, the way yes. the, the, these experiences touched you at a deep level, and that's yes. absolutely extraordinary. And thank you very much for, for sharing these precious experiences. But there's also another more intellectual uh, uh, side where, because you, you, you as a Christian would have believed, I assume, in the Trinity and the inca incarnation and the atonement and so on. So how did you, in your evolving journey, process this? Because these would have been obstacles, you know, believing in the Father, <coughs> Son, and Holy Spirit and so on. But uh, Tawheed, uh, one of the key words, is 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 very different and, and a very simple concept of the unity and the oneness of God. So how did you move in that direction towards the, this, uh, the, the, these different concepts? Yeah. So I, <clears throat> I think that, you know, there I was, Paul, hold away in East Kent before I moved back to London. I began my reading. And so I came across this belief in Tawheed, as mm. you say, the, the divine oneness, uh, the, the divine unity, la ilaha illallah, Mm. And I began to explore what this meant for me uh, as, a, as a Christian. Mm. And as I began to explore this Islamic belief, which is at the heart of, of Islam, yeah. it made me then, of course, explore who Jesus, who Jesus was for me and has been mm. uh, up to that point. Um, what was Jesus in my life? And I, I think Muslims sometimes underestimate the profound relationship 
that Christians talk of when they talk about the living Christ within them. Um, I think, uh, I may be wrong, but I think St. Francis of Assisi talked about uh, Christ has no eyes but yours, Christ has no hands but yours. And I, and I think Christians do believe that they have a very dynamic living relationship with, with Jesus. And I certainly did. Um, Jesus was at the very heart of who I was as a Christian. But as I began to explore Tawheed, the absolute oneness of God, of Allah, something very interesting happened because I began to then, of course, uh, explore uh, this idea of Jesus uh, as the son of God. And what did that mean in the New Testament? What did it mean in the Old Testament? Mm. And, and I began to then, in a sense, go back. I went back and began to explore the beginnings of the early church, the various Jewish and Christian sects that were operating at that time who had varying beliefs, varying narratives mm -hmm. of who Jesus was. And so I began to discover um, the Nazarenes and, and their belief that Jesus was indeed a prophet. I began to explore that the powerful dominance of St. Paul in the mm. early church. And, and I just want to talk just for a minute about Paul because um, Paul had a, as we know, had a religious experience on the road to Damascus and it changed his life completely. Um, but of course, Paul was somebody who had never met Jesus. Mm. He had a religious experience and we must never, never mock or denigrate people's religious experiences. I think they're true, I think they're real. Uh, and so I don't doubt for a minute Paul's conversion experience. But I think Paul then became, as we know, a very zealous convert mm. uh, to Christianity. And mm. I think it was Paul who began to, I think, widen Jesus's ministry and mission to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. Yeah. by redefining what son of God meant. Mm, if mm. you look at Hebrew scripture, if you look at the Jewish tradition, um, I think I'm right in saying that the son of God originally was anybody who was a man of piety, a man of great knowledge, a, grand of, a man of great respect and holiness. Mm. Yeah. And so you could uh, define Jesus in that respect, a man of incredible piety and knowledge, uh, somebody yeah. very special, but not literally the son of God. I think uh, Paul wanted and wished to widen the mission uh, to, the, to the Gentiles. And I think obviously they may have struggled with this Jewish concept. And so I, I would argue that Paul had a significant uh, part to play in the direction of mm. uh, the early church in the understanding of Jesus as literally, literally yeah. so, uh, the son of God. A, a figurative son of God. Uh, even Adam in Luke's gospel is called yes. the son of God. I think in chapter three, yes. David's right. called the son of God, King David. Lots of people are called son of God, but in yes. the figurative sense, as you say, as a righteous, pious human being alone. But the metaphysical sense of being the literal metaphysical son of God narrowed down just to one human being, Jesus, and then him, him being exalted to this divine <clears throat> state. That's completely different. Even though the same word is used, there's a transformation from the original Jewish matrix yes. to a Hellenistic cultural matrix. And you say something that like Giza Vermesh, the Jewish historian at Oxford, yes, has yeah. spoken eloquently about um, th this kind of cultural transformation that occurred when you yes. move to the pagan Greek or greco pagan world, and where there are lots of sons of God. Uh, exactly. and they're, they're divine figures and you know they, they pop down and visit human beings and you know you get this sense of mm, i can see some some familiar themes operating here um, uh, exactly yes yes and, and i i think as you say in greek mythology for example there are a, a wide number of i don't know for want of a better phrase god man figures who have superpowers yeah. um and, and i think this would have really um helped uh, non-Jews at the time relate to Jesus as this son of God figure. Um, mm. So I, I think as I was doing my reading, as I was unlearning and relearning um, a variety of different narratives, I began to 
reflect upon Jesus uh, and who Jesus was for me. And what was interesting is as my belief in Tawheed uh, began to take shape, um, I felt that Jesus began to shift in my heart and he took his rightful place mm. as one of the most revered prophets within Islam, peace be upon him. And when I did this, suddenly this beautiful deeper reality and depth of the oneness of Allah um, became uh, very apparent. It was like a door opening mm -hmm. um, and Jesus, bless him, peace be upon him, moved to the side and I could see directly um, at the reality of, of Tawheed and, and then bowing, uh, going into Sujood and <laughs> surrendering oneself to mm -hmm. Allah. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, bearing in mind, Paul, that in healthcare chaplaincy, I was dealing with a lot of human suffering, mm -hmm. um, either through long term suffering or through trauma. And I was encountering suffering on a daily basis. And my my belief in the incarnation of God made flesh of, of Jesus and God being among us, one of us was actually no longer helpful for me. Mm -hmm. It was no longer supporting me in the face of such great suffering. And sometimes people would challenge, challenge me um, about this. And so I began to see there was two reactions to all of this suffering. I could deny the reality of God and walk away, or I could surrender. Mm -hmm. and, actually, and actually, the great paradox is that it's through surrendering and um, letting go of our ego, letting go of the nafs, as we would say, uh, <clears throat> and bowing and, and prostrating ourselves to the mystery, the beauty, the mystery, the otherness, the oneness of Allah, that I felt I had gone into a much deeper relationship uh, with my God at that point. Absolutely extraordinary, very beautifully put. And I, I like the way you <clears throat> you describe it as a process of unlearning and relearning. Yes. Yes. So you're un unpicking uh, what you knew and then revisiting it and re... And that's exactly what I did uh, as well. You go back to the original sure. sources, you find out, well, what, what actually happened and just relearning the story and developing a new narrative, perhaps based on more solid uh, grounds. And you mentioned the very, in the very earliest communities there was a great diversity of beliefs um, about Jesus and salvation and so on. And, and this is often, uh, when I first encountered that fact, I found that uh, revelatory because I had assumed wrongly, projecting back my own beliefs that from the beginning, they were all, the Christians were all Trinitarian Christians and, and so on. And of course, it's not true. Um, it's only much later that these um, doctrines evolved uh, over a long period of time. So it was quite, quite revelatory. And then realizing the similarities between these early Jewish Christian beliefs and Islamic beliefs, in fact, Absolutely. they are actually pretty much the same. And when it comes to who Jesus was uh, and his ministry and, and so on, and this has been noted by even some uh, prominent Christian scholars like Hans Kung, uh, a yeah, famous yes. Catholic yeah. theologian who uh, noted this and saw that as a, a basis for mm -hmm. a rapprochement uh, between the different faiths. But um, that's another another story. So a fascinating uh, journey. Yeah, absolutely, Paul. I, I can really echo you. I, you know, I, rem I remember very distinctly standing in the corner of Zamzam Books, and mm -hmm. it was like my my head was exploding with with these alternative theologies <laughs> um, nice. and alternative narratives that were never never taught to me in seminary. Really. Um, so suddenly, I thought, wow. This is a moment, you know, the light bulb <laughs> was, yeah. was coming on. And, and as you say, it was a, a relearning and a rediscovering of, of, of those early days and, and, and how through persecution, through marginalization, certain groups were, of course, eventually silenced. And, and there are many, many swathes of texts that have been lost to history, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Particularly about James, the brother of Jesus, yes. uh, uh, who, who was literally the brother of Jesus, not some kind of, you know, um, who, who was the head of the church um, yeah. after Jesus uh, ascended to heaven. And he was very well known. All the independent historical sources tell us, whether it be Josephus or even the book of Acts and the Bible, that he was a pious Torah observant Jew for years. 
and he yeah. he didn't see his brother as god obviously and and you know he he, he didn't abandon the torah like some of the hellenistic yeah. christians under paul's influence did he, yes. he he was a faithful torah observant jew and and that that torah observance that uh observance of the sharia if you like in the jewish context is missing i would uh, i would suggest from uh christian's conceptualization of who jesus was he was a torah observant jew yes. and that means a lot because that tells us about his theology his Absolutely. attitude to god uh yes. that he would have submitted himself to god of course uh, as you say uh, and and that that key facet of him is 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 completely gone and, and largely under the influence of paul and the later emerging catholic church which yes. became a gentile religion yes. uh, and actually quite anti-semitic it actually ironically ended up uh rejecting the original faith uh, ironically and adopting a very different uh, roman gentile kind of religion um yeah yeah and and, and I, I i do find it fascinating I, I, i'll just digress for a moment you talked about jesus you know jesus was a palestinian jew mm. from the middle east um, yes. but, but of course you know um over centuries christianity in a sense was adopted as this gentile um you know, western religion uh, but uh, prophet muhammad peace and blessings be upon him came from the same region Exactly. of course a fellow a fellow arab um yeah. coming from uh, arabia and yet and yet of course um, that is seen as a very foreign very uh, alien uh, very ironic. religion very it's very ironic yeah i mean I, I in in the past when i when i was a, a christian you go into churches you'll see pictures of jesus and mary as caucasian individuals um who are just like you know other w white westerners um and and the sense of muhammad peace be upon him as an alien other is very ironic as you say because jesus was an aramaic speaking J palestinian jew he was not a white guy um from the middle east the yes. same part of the world that muhammad peace be upon them both are from and this and the 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 uh the spiritual bond and brotherhood between the two is very clear once you take away all the uh, the external wrappings that have been put around them by in the West, and they are very similar. And yet, one is seen as uh, one of ours, and the other one is seen as very other. And there's a great irony there, and a great injustice yes. Uh, yes. as well. Absolutely, I, I, I think I think there is. I would I would agree with you absolutely. Um, so I think, uh, and and also uh, as I was as reading and learning, of course, I. I, I revisited the gospels and the authenticity of the gospels the authenticity mm. of jesus words and and again you can argue that uh, the, the gospels uh, were not uh, in fact eyewitness accounts they were they were written much much later and so i began again to question this word authenticity mm. um, of those of those early texts and and so this you know during those days of reading in kent as as a hospice chaplain there there was this um change going on intellectually and and of course from the heart mm. uh, the heart and the mind were coming together to to go through this this change and i also began to question the idea of priesthood itself Right. Um, I, I find within the Catholic tradition and the Orthodox tradition and in many ways the Church of England um, that the idea of priesthood, it's a very clerical structure. It's very hierarchical uh, with archbishops and bishops and priests. And um, I went through quite a long, uh, rigorous selection procedure before I could even begin training to be a priest. And then ultimately you have this very grand ceremony as I did in Winchester Cathedral, yeah. uh, a very grand uh, a liturgy. And there's this moment, of course, as you may know, where the priest, uh, that the bishop places his hands upon your head. And it's at that moment, uh, you are quite literally changed mm -hmm. and you are then ordained. And I began really just to question this separateness, this otherness of the mm -hmm. priest and the laity. Mm -hmm. um, and how uh, the priest is very much placed on the pedestal. Uh, you are the priest in the sanctuary, the laity are in the congregation, uh, and uh, you are very much the leader. And, and there is a mystique, I would say. There is a mystique around priesthood. Um, and when I began to really get close to Islam, 
what I found was an incredibly egalitarian uh, religion where respect is earned through knowledge mm. and through another word of mine, taqwa. Mm. Um, and I think taqwa, a sense of piety, of God consciousness, of right. the fear of Allah really being in your heart. And anyone within Islam can lead uh, the, the salah, the, the communal prayer, but it's normally somebody who is deemed to be uh, perhaps a senior person in the community, but a person of respect who is respected and a person of knowledge. Yeah, there's no there's no um, strange uh, ceremony that you have to go through in order to lead the prayers. Um, we are we are one standing shoulder to shoulder. I can be next to a professor on one side. I can be next to a road sweeper on my other side. And mm. we are one. Mm -hmm. and, and that really uh, struck me as well um, when I was on the cusp of, of, of saying my Shahada. And, and perhaps I'd like to share my story of where I said my shahada. Please do. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> so at this point, I knew that I was on the very cusp of converting. Mm. So I made the decision to go and visit, go on holiday to a Muslim country. Mm. So the country closest to England and the cheapest to travel to was Morocco. Ah. So I went, I went to Morocco. And I went to the ancient city of Fez oh. in uh, northern Morocco, a very famous place of pilgrimage through history, mm. very famous for the al Karawin then university and, and mosque. Uh, it's known as the city of saints by mm. many, many, many great sheikhs, including, I, I can't remember his name, but there was a famous Senegalese sheikh who died oh, yes. in Fez. Yes, I can't I remember. Can't, I know you mean, yeah. I'm not sure. Um, Sheikh Jalani, I'm not sure. Anyway, but um, it, I, I went to Fez and it was the most extraordinary two weeks of my life. Wow. Um, I, I arrived in Marrakesh. I spent uh, a day and night in Marrakesh and then I traveled by train. It took about six or seven hours by train all the way to Fez. And I arrived and I went into the ancient uh, Medina, an incredible place of baraka, of, of blessing. And I think it was the second or third day, I then decided to walk into a, a mosque, an old mosque in uh, the Medina. And I went up to this young man and I said in English that I would like to become a Muslim. And he could only speak French or Arabic. Mm. So he called his friend over, uh, Taha, still a lifelong friend of mine and he sat me down there was about eight or nine muslims around me on the floor in a circle and uh he asked me some questions and i said yes i'm i'm ready to say the shahada um so i recited the shahada in english and then in arabic he then taught me how to perform wudu properly, the, the ablution, uh, the washing of oneself before the prayer. Mm -hmm. I then joined them for the duhur prayer, the lunchtime prayer in the mosque. I then immediately went back to my hotel room where I uh, washed the, the gusul, the, the, the washing. And that was the moment. Mm. I had become a Muslim in Morocco, in, in Fez, a place that I had known for many years through my interest in Sufi, Sufism. Um, Fez has an amazing biannual festival of sacred music. Mm. So I'd, I'd heard of Fez even as a priest. Um, so there I was in Fez, I'd become a Muslim. And um, I, I share a funny story. The next day I had some quite severe neck, neck pain. Mm. So I wanted to go to a public hammam a public a public bath for a massage and and a wash so i went back into the medina and two small moroccan boys uh, directed me to a, a public hammam and i walked in and i i was met by this this huge very muscular uh, moroccan man who proceeded to give me the most rigorous <laughs> and, and vigorous massage of my life and I was, I was lying I was lying flat 
mm. on a cold stone floor and my my bones were breaking and i literally thought this is my second day as a muslim and i'm going to die here yeah, in a yeah, hammam yeah. in fez <laughs> and i thought how how ridiculous is this <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but i but i felt a million dollars afterwards and i said to him i'd become a muslim and he was over the moon with happiness and i then said to him i love morocco mm -hmm. and he then he then scooped me up he lifted me up and as you might remember paul i'm a very slight man he mm -hmm. lifted me up and my my legs legs were dangling and and he said uh, and we love and we love you morocco loves you <laughs> um and so i i came out of that hammam spiritually but also now physically i i just felt completely and utterly alive and and uh, refreshed and and on a new path mm. i was now on a new path um i spent the rest of my days uh worshiping being in the masjids in fez uh, i then uh, decided to change my name you don't have to change your name mm -hmm. i decided to change my name to yusuf um, um, why, 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 why yusuf sorry why did you choose the name yes, Yusuf? So, so Yusuf um, was interesting because at the time, much, much later, my then, uh, uh, who's to become my mother-in-law, um, her favorite surah was Yusuf. Right. And whenever I would visit their home on a very old cassette player, on a very old tape, she would be playing surah Yusuf. And it was very crackly, very old. Um, and uh, it was a recitation by a very famous Egyptian um, imam. And and so Yusuf was something that was often being played as I would visit. So I decided to to change my name and, and become uh, Yusuf, not not legally, of course, but I became Yusuf. And the day I left Fez, I had become friends over the two weeks with uh, an owner of a restaurant, a Moroccan man. I would go there for my evening meal every every evening. And as I was leaving the hotel, suddenly he shouted, Yusuf. Oh. And it was the first time really in my life I was hearing my Muslim name. And I instinctively turned oh. to, to say goodbye to him. And it was in that moment I realized I was now on a very different path in my life. Wow. I'd made the change. I had the courage. Uh, I was... Um, listening to my heart um and it was at that moment i realized i'm now on a new journey mm -hmm. and so i went back to england and had mm. to face the music well that was uh, that's my next question i mean what did you tell your bishop <laughs> uh, well you, you know i i i was still a priest at this time at this Indeed. point yeah so um so actually um i i didn't i i decided <clears throat> Um, not really, uh, uh, maybe, I don't know if it was cowardice or, or being wise, but I actually decided to keep that private. So um, here and now, Paul, 13 years later, um, I'm going public. Um, ah. and this, this is the moment where some people, if they come across your channel, mm. will say, wow. So this is where he went. <laughs> um, so I, I left quietly. Right. I, I left quietly. I, it was very difficult because I was an NHS employee. Oh. So so I had to fulfill my contract. So I had to hand in, I, I gave three months notice. Again, that was an extremely difficult time of my life mm -hmm. because I was already a Muslim and it was a very, very difficult time uh, that those three months. Um, but I decided my last day was a Sunday and it was the cliche. I had a I had a cardboard box. I put my my belongings of my office into the box, and and I walked out on a quiet Sunday lunchtime, out of the hospital with my box, and that was it. Uh, I I was on a whole new journey. It was very it was very terrifying as well as exciting. Mm. Um, I had lost my my livelihood. I had lost my salary. I'd lost my home. Um, I was suddenly unemployed. And, and so, alhamdulillah, through the graciousness of Muslims and, and non-Muslims, I hasten to say, 
um, they put me up. I, I stayed in, I stayed with a, a lovely Muslim couple for a few weeks. Uh, I stayed with a dear colleague, yeah, a Christian for a number of weeks um, because I literally now had had nothing <laughs> mm. um, apart from uh, the small savings that I had in my in my bank account. And so when I when I walked into the unemployment office with my CV, you can imagine the raised eyebrows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do with this guy? <laughs> yes. Gosh. Um, wow. but, but alhamdulillah, uh, some months later, I, I was employed by a very good Quaker charity. Mm. And in my interview, I was very honest with my mm. journey right. of where I, where I was. And I do find the Quakers to be very all embracing, mm -hmm. very open. And, and you know, to their credit, they, they took that on board and they still employed me. It was a, a bereavement project. So they were looking for somebody with a lot of experience around bereavement and pastoral care. And, and liaising with hospitals and so on. So um, Alhamdulillah, I got the job uh, in East London for, for a year. Uh, but then but then I felt it was time to really break away. Mm. Uh, and I, I returned to my first love. My, my first degree is actually in English literature and English language. My second degree is theology. Mm. And so, so I, I retrained as, a, as an English teacher in central London again, which was an amazing time for me. Uh, and I then worked as a teacher in London for some time before then moving to Egypt and Cairo, where I taught uh, at a school in Cairo for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then my Middle Eastern life uh, took off and, and it's been 11 years now that I have been living and working in the Middle East, a, a year in Egypt and uh, 10 years, almost 10 years now in Oman. Gosh. So it's been an extraordinary journey. Absolutely extraordinary. And it's been a very, very touching uh, journey, uh, full of deep spiritual uh, insight and growth and uh, qu quite extraordinary. Um, uh, yes. Just a, a couple of uh, qu quick questions, if they are, if they yes. are quick questions. I mean, yes. what, what advice would you give to other priests who might be considering converting to, to Islam? I mean, your journey is so unique and so uh, infused with your own personal journey and so yes. on. I don't know if one can give other people advice, but what, would you give them any general pointers to other priests? Because there will be other priests out there yes. who who are considering this because for all, many similar reasons that you have yes. mentioned and other reasons as well. Yes. So it might be helpful if you could just say a few words, if that was possible. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think um, I wouldn't underestimate um, the the incredible difficult decision it is to make um, as a priest you are a public figure um, in Charlotte you are you are you have been a priest with great integrity uh, you don't want you don't want to let your congregations down you don't want to let anyone down you don't want to feel like you're betraying uh, your 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 the, ch the church of which you have been a devoted servant for so long so it takes great courage um, mm -hmm. I would say it takes great courage. Um, there are um, matters uh, of the dunya to consider. Um, you may have a family. You are possibly being housed in a church house. Uh, you have a, a monthly salary and you have a, a livelihood, a stipend um, each month. And of course, the reality is that the, the moment that you become a Muslim, all of that is taken away from you. And so it is, it is a, a, a huge decision to make. But ultimately, I think ultimately, for me at least, I, I could no longer live this lie anymore. Um, mm. I, I consider myself, I, I try and be as, as authentic as I can in my life. Um, I think that's what we're called to be. And ultimately, although I felt I was standing on the edge of a precipice, I had no idea if I was going to fly or fall. Mm. I just had to make that decision. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, um, with, with Baraka, um, Christians might say grace, um, I, was, I was carried and, and, uh, and I have found great blessings and I have encountered so many blessings by so many 
Muslim brothers and sisters around the world, um, people I've met, the places I've been, um, my wife, her family, um, people from a whole variety of cultures who share this religion. Um, it's been an incredible privilege um, and I have a grateful heart. I think, you know, living our lives, we should have a grateful heart uh, for, for the blessings that we have um, on a daily basis. Mm. And I, I think life, life, life's journey is like walking into a room backwards. <laughs> it's, not, it's not only until we get to the other side of the room and we survey the journey that mm. we can see God, Allah was at work in all of those moments of mm. trials and, and pitfalls and errors. And, and on, those, on that journey, um, I can see now that uh, I was on that journey and there was a momentum to it and, and it couldn't stop. So take heart, uh, have courage. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, it's between you and Allah. And of course, Allah, um, God knows the deepest part of our hearts. Allah is as close to us as our jugular vein. Um, and so I think it's being true, true to, to mm. that ultimately, I think is important. I would say that to priests and I would say that to actually any, anybody who was considering converting. But there's more at stake if you're a priest, of course. Yes, yes. And if any um, priests wanted to uh, contact you, perhaps they can con they can uh, uh, contact me and then I I'll yes. pass on their details to you in due course when you can have obviously a confidential sure. conversation. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. No, no, no problem at all. Um, I'm, sure so, yeah. mm. Sorry? I'm sure you're not the last. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I, I, I and I know I am aware it causes it causes a bit of a stir and it causes some news and and alhamdulillah our, mother, our muslim brothers and sisters take great celebration when they hear of a priest uh, converting um mm. but but i've never wanted to be a trophy mm. um I, i'm, I'm a, a simple ordinary person um who felt the call of god uh, mm. i did become a priest and and it's been a continuum on that journey so when i became a muslim it wasn't, in fact, a complete rejection of Christianity. Right. It was. It was. I was going deeper. Yeah. I felt I was going deeper on the journey to truth, and and for me, I got to a point where I realized um, I I had left my home of Christianity, and in fact, I was inhabiting I was inhabiting my new home of Islam before I had even taken the Shahada. Yes, that's, yes. That's what I'd realized, um, yes. of course. Of course. I, can, I can relate to that. And and, and part of that was that um, I, I asked you uh, before about books and uh, and resources Ooh. that were yeah. helpful to you. And I, I, I put in the uh, in the description below your, your own list of uh, books and, and videos and lectures and so on. So you can see. But I noticed two of the two of the items on there, which are, I personally really mm -hmm. like. The Road to Mecca by Mohammed Assad, another European who embraced Excellent. Islam. This is an extraordinary uh, work. If you've not read it yet, please get get a copy. Um, it, it's uh, quite extraordinary. And and the book I'm always going on, <laughs> Islam and the Destiny of Man by another Englishman, Guy Eaton, um, who was uh, uh, based at Regent's Park Mosque, where I said my Shahada and where I met you for the first yes. time, actually. Yes. Uh, we met there. And uh, this is an extraordinary book. And I remember as reading this as a Christian and at the end of it, even though I was still intellectually kind of a Christian, my heart, to use your, had or had got, had become a Muslim. Uh, I was just so uh, impressed by the beauty and the spiritual depth and insight contained in this extraordinary work uh, that I, I'd already become a Muslim in in the deepest sense. Uh, yes, yes, I, I, absolutely. I think it's very much a seminal work. Uh, another yeah. book I mentioned in the list, uh, which I found mm -hmm. very useful, was The Vision uh, of Islam. Uh, this is by a famous William uh, Chittick and also a Japanese convert to Islam, uh, Sachiko Murata. Mm. And it's a, it's a little bit of a tomb. It's quite a, quite a, a, a heavyweight book. But if you mm. wanted one book which encapsulates uh, the, the, the religion and the theology of Islam, I bought this in uh, Zamzam Books mm. um, some years ago. I hope it's still in print. Uh, this is also, I think, a seminal text. Um, worth worth reading, which I came across, which is also very good. Um, it's it's many books in one, as it were. 
I've not read that. I must. I must get a copy. Actually, yes. Yeah, the Vision of Islam. It's it's very good. Yeah, you mentioned Guy Eaton, Dr. Martin Lings uh, is a, another figure, and also um, I was absolutely amazed when I discovered that the great great scholar Al Ghazali, mm. um, and Al Ghazali has, as you know, so many uh, texts. Mm. And, and there's a wonderful, wonderful documentary on YouTube called The Alchemist of Happiness, which explores his life and his teachings. Um, it's very accessible. Um, and I think Ham uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad speak in this documentary. They are two great modern day figures. Uh, mm. Hamza mm. Yusuf is American, Abdul Hakim Murad is English. Um, I think they are both well worth listening to. Um, mm. when you are exploring um, Islam. And there are a whole wealth of, of books and YouTube channels out there. Mm. As you know, some of them are excellent. There's some terrible, terrible <laughs> stuff uh, which is out there. And so I think you have to have discernment. Yes. You, you have to know, you know, listen, if this doesn't feel right, I think walk away from it. Mm. Um, and uh, just try and find and discover um, you know, th those people, scholars, past and present, who are worth listening to. Mm -hmm. And just a shout out quickly for young, for young Muslims or young people exploring Islam. Um, I, I would recommend there are four, four YouTube channels that I really love and really explore what it's like as a convert to be oh. living, to be living oh. an Islamic life. Um, there is a, a, a South Korean guy called Daud Kim and he converted to Islam and he has a very big YouTube following and he's he shares his new Islamic journey and he's tra he travels to different countries um, he's worth watching J J Palfrey is an English a young English man who has also converted to Islam and he travels to mainly Muslim majority countries and at the moment he's in Cairo for Ramadan He's got a huge following on YouTube, uh, uh, millions of people. And you, you watch yes. his video, you think, I can see why. He's, he's very compelling. Um, yes. But yeah, he's encouraging yes. Ramadan. And I noticed, yes. yeah, I saw that. Yeah. 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 He, he's, he's great. Um, and um, again, there was a young, a young English teenager who lives in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. Um, obeyed, obeyed Fox. Again, very unassuming. He's, he's living his life as a Muslim with his family. And it's, I think it's just a lovely, uh, he, ha he has lovely videos for young, for young people, particularly teenagers, Muslim or not. Um, and he's very natural in the way he talks about his Islamic life um, in Saudi Arabia. And finally, there is a, an English sister called Aisha Rosalie, mm. who also, I think, has a wonderful channel where she really speaks very humbly and genuinely from her heart about her own journey to, to Islam. And um, there are many channels out there, but those four, um, I think are, are, are very useful if you just want to watch uh, something and, and hear about people's stories. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, uh, there are other much more academic, uh, weightier uh, YouTube channels, which are also very good. Your channel, Paul, yeah, your your channel, Paul, uh, is very good. I stumbled across your channel by chance. Oh. I realized who it was, somebody that I'd known many years ago. And I think you're, you have such a, a wide range of, of, of subjects and a wide range of scholars that come mm. onto your channel, um, I think is, is excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Um, very, very blessed indeed. Um, yes. My last question, um, I mean, about your hopes and plans for the future but you, you strike me as someone um who's not only just very eloquent uh, and and very um able to articulate concepts and feelings Thank you. What, 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 what about you writing something what about <clears throat> expressing this in a, in a more public forum whether it be youtube or in books for example um yes. would that be something you'd be willing to explore now you have perhaps more publicly uh, known yes. now um, um what are your hopes and plans for the future um you know, I, before I agreed to come on your channel, I, I thought to myself, why now? Mm. Why have I decided after 13 years to go public? And interestingly, of course, I've now been a Muslim longer than I was an ordained priest. Mm. 
Oh. Uh, I was ordained a priest in 1999. I've now been a Muslim almost 13 years. So that, mm. that's interesting in itself. But I, I think it's taken me this long to really be at peace in my Islamic skin, if you like, mm. uh, and, and to go on that journey and to process quite a lot of, of feelings um, on, on that journey. And so it felt right. I discovered your channel. Um, mm. You're somebody I, I respect and admire greatly. So it felt like everything was coming together. Mm. Um, and it felt absolutely right to now speak and to, uh, in a sense, uh, speak with confidence now about yeah. my journey. I am, I, I do love words uh, and I do mm. love writing. I write, I write poetry. Um, mm. And some, and, and, and perhaps you're right that in due course, um, this may be something that I now want to explore in some way, whether mm. that be through the spoken word or through what the writing. Mm. Um, but that's something I, I, I would consider. I do feel as, a fa as my family, we're at a crossroads in our life. We've been in the Middle East 11 years. Mm. We are not sure what to do. We're not sure whether to stay in the Middle East, Oman or elsewhere. We're not sure whether to return to the UK, uh, um, that fills me with some trepidation. Mm. Uh, so we are, we are. I feel I'm at this. A, a new chapter is opening. Mm. I have no idea what that is, um, but I think coming on today and speaking with you, Paul, uh, is the first step mm. of that new chapter. Mm. Um, and I feel now um, by doing this, um, I've I've opened the door slightly. Mm. Um, and I'm going to see where, where Allah takes me on, on this journey now. Gosh, I'm, 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 I'm not, I'm going to resist temptation and to make suggestions because I'm not oh. going to suggestions. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let God guide you, um, to where he wants you to be. And I'm sure he will, because you're very clearly very open to his guidance, um, uh, which is an inspiration, uh, to us all, particularly, um, this Ramadan. Um, well, I, I think um, maybe we can. That's a natural conclusion. I think. Just, 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 just one, just one word. I, there, there was one more, one more Arabic word I forgot to mention, oh, which please. again maybe, maybe very appropriate for Ramadan, is when I discovered the word Tauba. Oh, right. uh, and and this this um, or maybe Christians would relate to repentance hmm. of of coming to Allah uh, with Tauba with a, with a penitent heart. And, and asking for uh, forgiveness. Um, and, and it's a direct relationship, of course, coming to Allah, uh, our creator with, with Tauba, I think is the first step to that softening of the heart that I talked about or, or mm. the clearing away of the rust of, of, of um, that jihad with our nafs, with our ego. Um, I think so often we are driven by our egos. And I think what Islam does, authentic Islam is it softens, it softens the heart. And I think, you know, I want to end with those four words that I shared. Tawheed, firstly, taqwa, baraka, the blessings, and tawbah. Mm. I think those four words, when I discovered them, just opened up a, a whole new pathway and discovery um, and relationship with, uh, with our God, with Allah. So, mm. subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, and, and going forward, I pray that, again, this Arabic word risk, what is my risk for mm. me and my family, that I follow that path and it will be khair, it will be good for me and for my family, inshallah. Um, mm. So it's been wonderful to talk, Paul. Well, it's been extraordinary. Uh, thank you so much indeed, uh, Yusuf, for sharing with your extraordinary journey from uh, the Christian priesthood in London and Kent to, to Oman, where, uh, where you are now. And... Uh, I uh, do hope uh, you'll be blessed in the future. I'm sure you will. And you continue your journey wherever it will take you. Uh, yes. Back in England or uh, yes. in the Middle East still, I'm, I'm sure that God will, will continue to use you um, in interesting you. ways. And uh, and likewise uh, for you, Paul, likewise. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So um, on, on that note, thank you very much, uh, Yusuf, for your time. And, um, thank you so much. And th thank you. Until next time. Yes, inshallah. Masalama. Masalama. Thank you, Paul. Thank you.